it. All right, I'll give this another three seconds. Three, two, <laughs> one. <laughs> okay, yeah, you're live. There's a lag in there. All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our very first Amshia Star Party. Um, we are San Jose Astronomical Association, and this is the very first time we are bringing this uh, event to you. And we are really glad you all are joining us here today. We have a great, great show for you. We have a number of our San Jose SJA members uh, waiting to present to you. I hope you enjoy this. And I also welcome at this point, uh, this is our first time, so I really, really, really welcome your feedback. So uh, please send it to us. Okay, so before we get started on this, I want to give you a couple tips uh, to make this experience uh, better for you. The first one is try to find your dark theme in the YouTube. Uh, it's a little button there uh, on the right hand side and turn it on because we are going to show themes that's pretty dark in the background. It'll, it'll, have, it'll be better for you to, to see those objects. The second one I want to give you is, uh, sorry, the second one I want to give you is the, uh, the YouTube quality. If you could pick the quality uh, to be 720p or higher, um, because we have some some objects that's really fine detail, you'll be able to see it better that way. Now, later on, if you have trouble with the feed, you may want to go back to the auto mode and the YouTube quality. Okay, so while we wait for probably a few of you guys that are still joining in, to this program. So let's, uh, I want to just introduce our club and talk a little bit about this club and what we do. Uh, we are San Jose Astronomical Society. Uh, we were established in 1954 as an educational uh, organization, uh, educational uh, organization for our members as well as the public. And we are a nonprofit organization. All of us are volunteers here today uh, doing this program. We have a number of programs out there. We have tons of public programs and we have a number of uh, members only programs too. So I'm going to kind of go through these public programs. There's some notes on here put down. So we have tons of star parties. Uh, normally uh, they are uh, in-person star parties. So we have um, in-town star parties. We do about a couple times a month. We have starry night star party. We do in the Rancho Cañada open space preserve uh, with in conjunction with the uh, Santa Clara Valley uh, open space authority. Uh, but once, once a month. And we also have Stoller observing, binocular stargazing, pinnacle star party, and I can keep you know going for the list, but there's a ton of them for the public. Um, so not only for the public, we also have for the Bay Area schools, we have dedicated people in our organization that goes for the South Bay schools and conduct school star parties. Um, and then we get to our talks. We have talks, uh, we have introductory talks, as well as um, advanced talks uh, where we bring in um, guest speakers and, and do, and do these talks once a month. Um, so what else? Yeah, we have equipment help we give to the public. We do uh, swap meets where you can exchange or buy and sell gear, use gear with the public. Um, and we also do a newsletter uh, four times a year. So those are all public things that this club offers. Moving on to our members. Actually, let me get my... Oops, okay, anyways, mouse is good enough. Um, our member-only programs, we have imaging group, very robust imaging group. Uh, we do imaging is, by the way, is astrophotography. Uh, that program is, is very strong in our club. And we also do beginner training for our members. Uh, we do equipment training for our members, uh, actually equipment training and equipment loaner. And also we have a member library. Uh, lastly, we do a tons of, uh, member only private observing events. So those are all member benefits, uh, $20 a year. And uh, here's our club website, sjaa.net. Uh, most, I believe most of our public programs we advertise in meetup.com. Okay, um, actually I forgot to introduce where the club is. Um, uh, most of you probably already know where we are. We are in San Jose in Hogi Park, but there may be um, those out there that's joining us from non-local. San Jose is, uh, a, a suburb south of San Francisco, California. And this event is new. We are doing this new format to cover our public star parties that we normally do uh, in person because of the COVID-19 situation. All right, so I want to introduce you to our party host, host today. Um, my name is Kanch. I am the person usually organize the intern star party and I'm the person who 
run the loaner telescope program for our members uh, and then comes uh, Carl and Rashi. Um, uh, by the way, guys, uh, I can't see you guys, but just kind of wave you, wave your hand or something, so show who you are. Um, Carl and Rashi are our leaders in the our dark sky star party uh, in Rancho Cañada. And um, if you had been there, or uh, hopefully you'll go there in the future, and you'll you'll you might meet Carl. And Carl is the person who knows the sky from back of his head. Uh, he doesn't need a map to to point things out. And Rashi is a guy who's giving the uh, uh, the what's up in the sky talk, and he has a, a great uh, star chart that he gives a star chart talk. So you'll see these guys over there in those events. And and then I'm going to introduce uh, Glenn and Bruce. Glenn and Bruce, say hi. Uh, Glenn and Bruce okay. are our imaging leads, uh, our astrophotography leads. Uh, like I said, we have a very robust program. We are being in the in the heart of Silicon Valley. There's tons of knowledge, tons of members who make great great astrophotography it's just rival some of the pictures that you would see in uh, from uh, uh, these uh, public uh, telescopes um, so these guys are going to help us today with this uh, virtual event um, and i'm going to move into paulo francisco and paul uh, members of the imaging program volunteering today uh, hopefully to show us uh, uh, some live views as well as some of the pictures they have taken in the past um, then then this wolf Wolf is uh, our solar program leader, and also he's the person who conducts the Astronomy 101 talks. Uh, if uh, any of you guys had uh, listened yesterday, he did a, his first talk online yesterday. Um, and then comes, uh, uh, last but not, it's very important uh, uh, to members here, we have uh, Sukada. Uh, Sukada is our uh, one of our board members, as well as she runs the uh, guest uh, speaker program for us, and Amy is our secretary as well as our editor for the uh, ephemeris, our uh, newsletter. So these are our members, and we are not. I just want to give a note here: we are not professional astronomers, but among us, we had years of, you know, very experience in various parts of astronomy, and hopefully, we can we can bring that knowledge to you today. Um, I need to uh, mention a very uh, Sad event here. There was a somber note today for all of us. Uh, a few days ago, our dear president Jerry Joyce passed away suddenly, and uh, he's he's one of the people who really pushed us to uh, get our programs uh, into the public, uh, into this uh, virtual space. And he he would have been here. I'm sure he's looking down upon us from somewhere. And this program is is dedicated for Jerry. Uh, Jerry, thank you. Okay, so let me kind of go through what's our plan today. Um, we are going to first, uh, Rashi and Carl are going to jump in. They're going to introduce, uh, take you through uh, a little tour of the night sky today. Um, they are going to also introduce you a little bit to uh, what might be coming later on in the actual armchair observing uh, part of this program. And then I'll come back in, I will, introduce you a little bit to, to uh, astronomy gear, and then we will start our armchair observing session. And here, I hope, we hope to see uh, some live objects um, and as well as uh, some pictures that our members have uh, taken, and we'll talk about them. The weather I checked earlier in all around the South Bay looks great today. So hopefully, you know, we are up, you know, in for a good treat. Um, and uh, lastly, we'll get everybody will get back together here, and we will uh, do a Q&A session. I urge you to send your questions early. Uh, you you have access to the YouTube chat. Please send your questions, and we have uh, two or three moderators there, and they might answer your questions or they might take your questions, and we'll try to get to uh, as many questions as possible at the end of this program. Okay. So what else? So before I get started, I'm going to go back a few slides here. Um, for those of you who might be joining us a little bit late, uh, I mentioned this for for a good experience in this program. Just try to get to the dark theme in YouTube um, and also try to get to a higher quality video in YouTube. Okay, I think we are ready to get started. And Rashi and Carl, take it away, please. Awesome, thank you, Fanch. Uh, you may want to quickly stop presenting and I'll go ahead and take over. Um... Let's do I think that. you can take over, but let me see. Yes, I will do that. 
Ooh. Give me a second, trying to figure it out. That's Guys, right. this is the first time everybody watching this. We are still trying to figure out how to how to do this very smoothly. Um, but... No worries. I think we are in. Okay. So, guys, um, welcome. Uh, my name is Rashi, and um, I'll be co-hosting this part of the segment with Carl. We're going to talk about the night sky. Um, and you know, before we before we we get into things, couple of couple of few, a few things for you guys. We're going to walk through some slides, uh, some material. Um, to get you guys oriented. And then after that, we're going to get into a planetarium app called Stellarium. And Stellarium is something that you can download on your computer. It's free. Uh, you can download that and, and set it up on a variety of different platforms and uh, and learn about the night sky. And that's something that we'll actually show to you tonight. Now, as we continue into this segment, um, one of the big questions that we always get, you know, what's up in the night sky? So. Carl, if you wanna if you wanna help our viewers out here, what's up in the night sky? Well, there's a lot. So, by the way, my name is Carl, but uh, this slide is just scratching the surface. You're absolutely right, Carl. We're just scratching the surface. There's so much out there. There's a whole universe worth of stuff out there. But when we start talking about astronomy, when we look up in the night sky, you know, we start looking up and gazing with our naked eyes. We we use binoculars. We use telescopes for assisted viewing. And you know, to make sure that that we you know we're able to cover some topics, of course, we had to shrink that number of stuff down. Uh, so so that way we can talk about it tonight. Now, let's start off with our solar system, right? Our solar system. Well, first of all, it is a one star system. Our sun happens to be a yellow dwarf star. And of course, beyond just our star that we get to see during the day, we also have planets. Earth is one of the planets. We've got eight major planets and a few dwarf planets. Pluto did get demoted to being a dwarf planet. Our Earth happens to have one moon, uh, whereas many of the other planets have multiple moons. Mars has two moons. We've got Saturn in the lead now with 82 moons and Jupiter running in second place with 79 moons, right? Um, what else can we see? We can see satellites and we can see asteroids and comets. And stars come in different configurations, right? You've got binary star systems. That means two stars that are doing a, a, a dance that are gravitationally bound. We have multiple star systems where you could have three or more stars that happen to be gravitationally bound. And then of course stars, you know, uh, just like just like celebrities, uh, they, they love friends. They like to congregate in groups. So when you've got just a few hundred friends or just low thousands, you know, sparsely uh, dispersed in the night sky, those are open clusters. But then you've got stars that go to a concert together, then that mosh pit, right, densely packed, having a lot of fun. Well, you know, when you end up with thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of stars in these clusters, they're called globular clusters. And these are ancient clusters in the night sky. Right, they're, they're as ancient as our galaxy or even older. Uh, some theories primarily state that uh, these are cores of smaller galaxies that are, there are you know, remnants of cores of galaxies um, that are now orbiting our galaxy because the rest of it has pretty much been consumed by our galaxy. Now, of course, we've got constellations in the night sky. We know about the, the 12 zodiacal constellations. There are about 88 constellations uh, that have been um, uh, documented by the, uh, the International Ast uh, Astronomical Union. And then, uh, within these constellations, we find patterns, human recognizable patterns, like the pan and the panhandle and the Big Dipper, and those are asterisms, right? Uh, we've got the, the Sagittarius teapot as well, uh, you know, and that will come up later on in the summer, and we'll get to see that uh, in, in, in future star weather. You've got star clouds, you've got nebulae, large uh, clouds of gas and dust, and then, of course, you've got these massive containers called galaxies that contain all of this wonderful stuff in the night sky. Now, we are at May 23rd, that happens to be today. So let's talk about some planetary highlights. Carl, can you help our viewers out with some of these planetary yeah. highlights? Yeah, it looks like you got uh, Mercury, Venus, and the crescent moon out. That's about, if you were to look outside now, you would see it low on the western horizon. Yeah, and then you've got the the moon in a very, very thin waxing crescent. Uh, the moon shows different phases as it orbits the Earth, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and we'll also talk about what, you know, what it means when, when the moon is growing from new moon to full moon and then back down again. We'll talk about uh, how I happen to remember it. But there's also an orientation of a few planets in the morning sky, Carl. Can you talk about that for us, please? 
Yeah, it looks like if you, you're up about three o'clock in the morning, you go outside, look uh, pretty much southerly, east, south, east, east, south. You see Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars coming up, all in a pretty nice, neat row. Yeah, and then uh, you know, as the as the days go by or the next few weeks go by, and we get further along into the summer, we're going to see this congregation of, of planets uh, earlier on, right in in the night sky, and then of course in the evenings as well. So keep a lookout. You're going to see Saturn and Jupiter and Mars with the naked eye uh, coming up right now. It's super early, uh, but you will get to see that in the few uh, upcoming upcoming weeks uh, in your evening uh, time. Now we talked about moon phases, right? So we happen to be at this phase of the waxing crescent. Now, for all of you that grew up with uh, Karate Kid, you guys do remember wax on, wax off. Um, I've modified that a little bit with wax on and wane off, and that's pretty much how I remember the, the phases of the moon, right? So when you're going from new moon all the way to full moon, it is the waxing time, and then you're waning down back to new moon. So you've got the waxing crescent to start off with, then you've got the first quarter, the waxing gibbous, full moon, the waning gibbous, the third quarter, the last quarter, the, the waning crescent, and then back down to new moon. So we literally just passed new moon, so we're at a very, very thin crescent in the night sky when it comes to the moon. And of course, interesting fact that when you look at the same moon phase from the northern hemisphere versus the southern hemisphere, it is 180 degrees flipped. So whenever you're talking to somebody that happens to be on the other side of the, of the world, on the other hemisphere, just keep in mind that they're seeing opposite of what you're saying when you look at them. One big question that we always get is how much can I see with, with uh, the naked eye? Um, and you know that does, there are a lot of factors that impact uh, night sky conditions. But before we get into that, you know, let's take a look at this first column here. This is the inner city sky. So when you happen to be in a very light polluted city, you're just gonna see very few bright objects in the night sky. And then as you go down into suburbia, you're gonna see a lot more in the night sky. And then getting out an excellent dark sky sight, you can see definitely a lot more, right? Not just the stars, but you can start to see, you can see the, the Milky Way, uh, you know, during the summer months coming up and hints of many other different structures in the night sky. But really how much is that, right? So if we take a look at San Jose, on a good day with good weather, we happen to see up to positive three or positive four magnitude. Um, apparent magnitude is the brightness of objects in the night sky as seen from Earth. So we can pretty much see somewhere less than 600 stars plus some of the other bright objects in the night sky in San Jose on a good night. But at a very dark sky site, we're able to see anywhere between 5,200 to 5,900 stars in the night sky up to a positive 6.5 magnitude and here of course the greater you go in magnitude the dimmer the object is in the night sky and that happens to be the limit of our, our eyes uh, when we're looking at the night sky. Um, keep in mind that that range of 5200 to 5900 is primarily because of your you know eyesight but could also be other factors we've already talked about light pollution it could be weather cloud cover humidity wind dust and then finally for all the people that have seen Independence Day you could actually have aliens blocking the view of your night sky with a massive ship. And if that is indeed the case, I'm sure we have other problems. But if you happen to be an astrophotographer like Glenn and Bruce and some of the others that are on, on there, you might Folks, we uh, may have an audio interruption. Yeah, it sounds like uh, aliens got them, but yeah. Uh... <laughs> Hopefully Stay not. On for your hands. Nah. All right, good. I think so. you made fun of aliens, man. Oh, I did. All I right. did. All yeah. right, guys. So let's okay. move on over to Stellarium right here. So we are in a, a planetarium app. Let me go ahead and sort of kind of resize this for you guys just a bit more. So Carl, I am in Stellarium. What are we looking at? Wow. Well, you got RCDO. Right there. Thank you very much, Rossi. I could, well, I could, I could feel the fresh air now. It's very <laughs> nice of you. Um, well, I think the credit definitely goes over to Glenn. Glenn, thank you so much for for getting these images for us, so that actually people can see what RCDO looks like. Uh, we are at RCDO Rancho Cañada del Oro in Morgan Hill. That's one of our dark sky sites, and uh, we are looking. I believe we happen to be looking westward. 
but Carl, I don't, I don't see Venus and and Mercury and and uh, and the Moon. What's going on here? Yeah, I don't see it either. It must be pretty low uh, down towards the horizon. Perhaps mm -hmm. the uh, horizon is kind of like blocking it a bit. You know what? That's a very good point. So we are in a planetary map, so we can do a little bit of magic here, technical magic. We can go ahead and uh, and take away the ground um, and turn on the horizon. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to take off, take the ground away, and we happen to be right here. I think um, we need to go to, there we go. Uh, let me make yeah. sure we are in the right location. I have a feeling we might not be. No, we are. We are. So you can see that Mercury, Venus, and Moon happen to be very, very low to the horizon. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit here. So Carl, what should we take a look at? Let's take a look at Venus. All right, let's take a look at Venus. While I go ahead and get Venus centered and zoom in, you want to give our viewers a few facts about Venus? Well, Venus is the second planet from the sun, third brightest in the sky after the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. And it's named after the Roman goddess of love and beauty. Oh my God, that's, that's amazing. I think, and I think Venus also happens to be the only planet in the solar system that is actually named after a female figure. Isn't that true? Yes, it is. All right. What else can you tell us about Venus? Well, Venus sometimes referred to as the morning star and the evening star. But it's not a star. It happens to be a planet. Our ancestors did not know that, right? So, but it's very, very interesting how it shows up both in the evening and sometimes in the morning. And we'll actually talk about that because not only Venus does it exhibit phases, but the position of Venus in its orbit actually also dictates whether it shows up in the evening or it shows up in the morning. What else you got on Venus? Anything else that you want to share? Oh, Venus is the hottest planet in the solar system. Average temperature is about 462 Celsius. Oh my not God. much, not much, uh, Temperature difference between night and day. Wow, that is absolutely amazing. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to quickly switch over back to the slides. And what I want to do is I'm going to cover this slide. Uh, let's go back in presenter mode and uh, make sure that everyone is able to see this slide. All right, so we've got Earth up top, um, and um, and we've got Venus at the bottom. So when Venus happens to be behind Earth, um, and the closer it is, it exhibits uh, a crescent in the evening sky. Right? When it's further behind us, it exhibits more of that half phase or slight gibbous phase. Right? But when Venus actually bypasses Earth, uh, then it shows up in the morning sky. So then again, you know, when the closer it is to Earth, it'll be the crescent phase, it'll exhibit a crescent phase, and then the further away it gets from us, it'll then exhibit again a half phase or a given space. So now that we've taken a look at, uh, at Venus, Carl, where else should we go in the night sky? Back at RCB. Well, behind us, if we're looking west, behind us would be east. Mm -hmm. So let's go north. That would be to our right. To our right, somewhere around here, I'm thinking, right? Yeah. Yeah, but Carl, I'm having a hard time. I mean, uh, if I'm looking at the night sky and I have an untrained eye, what is a pattern that I could pretty much utilize to, to find what that? A, the pattern would be an asterism in Ursa Major. How about looking at the point of stars um, by the uh, Doobie and Merrick? What does it point to? So that's interesting you call that out, right? So the asterism that you're really calling out is the pan and the pan handle that happens to be in an Ursa Major uh, or the Big Dipper, right? And then and then let's find that. And you've got you've got this these stars here, they sort of kind of find a form a pan upside down, and you've got a pan handle. Oh, wait a second. We are using a planetary handle. I'm not just looking at the night sky, we can do technical magic. I can turn on the lights. Or the lines on, on the constellations. Let's, let's just go and do that. There we go. I really wish we could do this in the real night sky, right? We could flip a switch and we could turn on the lines, but you know, uh, 
we have to use hats and star charts and planispheres for that. So, so uh, if everybody can see this in the night sky, or at least in, in Stellarium, we've got the pan and then the pan handle right over here, and that's an Ursa Major. This pan and pan handle is an asterism, and it's about one third of the total size of Ursa Major. These two stars, the, the rightmost stars of the pan, are uh, Merak and Jube. They're pointer stars, and they point straight down to Polaris, the, the North Pole star. And Polaris happens to be the pale star of, um, of Ursa Minor, the, uh, the little bear. Let's click on that, and there you go. All right, so while we're here, let me go ahead and turn the constellation arc on, right? So everybody can see what the big bear and the little bear look like. And now we can see the big bear is pretty much upside down, sort of. And then we've got Ursa Minor uh, going straight up, um, right underneath Draco the Dragon. And Draco the Dragon, this constellation, primarily surrounds Ursa Minor, protecting uh, the, the little bear. OK. Now we are in this region. Let's take a look, a closer look at Polaris. So I am going to go ahead and turn the arc off. And I am going to zoom in a little bit on Polaris. Now there is an asterism near Polaris, and I'll bring that up. But while we do that, Carl, how far is Polaris from us? Polaris is pretty far. Let's see. I got my notes here, and I, Polaris is four hundred thirty-three light years away. Oh my gosh, four hundred thirty-three light years away from us. And, and one light year is the distance traveled by light, right? And in one year, which is roughly about six six hundred six trillion miles. That's, that's, you know, and you multiply that by 433, that's a very, very, very large number. Hey, Rashi, this is Kanj. Uh, just sorry to disturb. I think there's a little yeah. bit of noise coming from your mic. Could you get it a little bit closer to your mouth, maybe? Sure. Is this better? Actually, it's not. Okay, I don't know where that noise is coming from, um, but uh, let's just continue on. Yeah, okay. Yeah? All right. All right, so coming back to this, what, we, what I've done here is I've turned the asterism uh, feature on, and you can see this asterism called the engagement ring of Polaris. It's a bunch of stars that sort of kind of form the, uh, the, um, the base pattern of the ring, and Polaris happens to be that diamond rock uh, at the top of the ring. It's a great pattern um, to, to look at in the, in the night sky. You can actually even see this with binoculars. And of course, one of our older um, uh, SJA presidents tried to offer this engagement ring to his wife. Course, at that point, she just didn't know. She wanted a real ring, but she said no. So, for all the guys out there, if you're going to try to offer this ring to, to your partner, uh, please don't do that. It's not going to work. So, Carl, we're in the vicinity of um, Ursa Minor and Ursa Major. What else should we take a look at? Well, you know, now the, the, the point of stars point to Polaris, mm -hmm. but the uh, handle of Ursa Major also points to a special star. If you follow the arc to Arcturus, it leads you right to a nice fourth magnitude orange star. In the Buddhist constellation, right? It's, it's a massive, it's, a, it's an orange giant. It's a beautiful star to take a look at. And of course, when you take a look at it visually, you can actually get that hint of slight orange or slight red when you are looking at it. And it is in the Buddhist constellation. And the Buddhist constellation happens to look like a kite. So of course, when you uh, join the lines here, you can see sort of kind of a kite pattern. And our first happens to be that pale star, that streamer star of that kite. Now, Carl, from our first, we can go further on, right? If we follow the arc, what is what is the saying? How, how do we do that? Sorry, Carl, I think you're on mute. Carl, sorry, I think I muted you. Carl, can you unmute? Uh, you're going to have to unmute him from the... I don't think I can do that. Oh. We're okay. trying to figure out the audio problem. All right, uh, while we go ahead and do that, so from the panhandle of Ursa Major, you can arc to Arcturus. And then you can go ahead and spike down to spike that in Virgo. So I'm going to go ahead and turn that constellation arc back on. 
and we can take a look at this in a different light. So you've got person major, you've got the pan, and then the pan handle. From the pan handle, you can arc to our first and duties, and then you can go ahead and spike down to spike up and do the Now, of course, one of the other things to keep in mind is we've got uh, Lyra the Heart constellation coming up. Uh, and uh, there's a bright star in, uh, in Lyra called Vega. And when you go from Arcturus down towards Vega, you can actually cross through Corona Borealis, which is a bunch of stars that look like um, the uh, big smiley face in, in the night sky, and that is the, the Northern Crown. And then you'll pass through this keystone of Hercules um, in the Hercules constellation, and then you'll finally get to Vega. All right. So have we been able to unmute Carl? I think Carl has to unmute himself. Yeah, we still have the, the noise issue. It's not Carl. How about now? Sorry, folks, we are having some issues. This is, this is issues with bringing a lot of people together here. Okay, I can't mute, uh, unmute Carl as well. Uh, so if anybody else has admin rights, you can go ahead and unmute Carl. Carl can unmute himself. No, nobody else can do he that. Has it from the phone as well as the mute. Yeah. Um, is not able to. Let me connect with him. Okay. While we go and do that, let me go ahead and continue the show. Sorry, guys, for the technical difficulties. And uh, let's talk about some of the objects that we're going to be taking a look at um, later on tonight. So there is one object. It's a planetary nebula that happens to be right below the the the, the pan of um, Ursa Major. And let's see if I can zoom in and find that. And that happens to be the Owl Nebula. It's a beautiful planetary nebula. And of course, we do have um, a couple of our images that have a beautiful image of this of this nebula. So as you can see, I'm going to zoom back out again. This is the pan of the uh, of the asterism, and you've got Merak, you've got Vector right here, and then right close to Merak, you can actually see the Owl Nebula, M97. Now below the um, Owl Nebula towards uh, Merak, you actually get to see a galaxy right here, and that happens to be the circle of galaxy. Um, if I can click on it, and that is a satellite that is going right by us in our view. It seems like I can't click on the circle lines. But nonetheless, the uh, the Owl Nebula is something that we'll be taking a look at, uh, a planetary nebula. Of course, the, the name planetary nebula happens to be a misnomer, has nothing to do with planets, uh, but it is a beautiful nebula that is created during the, uh, uh, the red giant star going into the last phase of its life, it becomes unstable, and then it sheds the outer layers of uh, uh, of itself into either a disk or a bubble. And the Al Nebula is an example of that bubble uh, of the, 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 the outer layers being shed outwards. Near Alcade, the uh, uh, the end star of the the Panhandle, there happens to be a beautiful galaxy called the Pinio Galaxy, and then the one. And let me see if I can zoom in a little bit here. There we go. It's a wonderful spiral galaxy. Again, one of our imagers have a beautiful image of this, and we'll showcase that during the armchair observing session. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, we talked about globular clusters, right? Densely packed clusters of stars. Um, let's take a look at, um, let's go down to Arcturus. And between Arcturus and Carl Caroli, there happens to be a globular cluster called M3. So let's go and find that here. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. So I'm going to go ahead and zoom in. And show you guys what this globular cluster looks like. And it is estimated that this globular cluster happens to have about 500,000 or half a million stars in the world. I'll zoom back out again. And let's reorient ourselves one more time. So we're looking north. We've got Ursa Minor right here. We've got Ursa Major up top. 
we did the trek to Arcturus and then spike to Spica uh, from Arcturus uh, that uh, that is in the Boothies constellation that looks like the kite. We actually traversed our way down to Vega. But then on the other side, we've got the Gemini twins and we have Cancer. Now in Cancer itself, we've got a beautiful uh, open cluster of stars called the Beehive Cluster. So let's go ahead and find that. All right, here we go. This is where we have got the, the, the Beehive Cluster right over here. Again, a beautiful open cluster of stars. We've got an amazing image coming, um, coming out in the, the, one of the next segments of the show for you. Uh, seems like uh, Carl is still muted. Paul, well, you can hang up and try joining back in back in again um, from your phone. Yeah, I notified call. Hang. I had not heard back anything. Uh, so you still have this audio problem with you. Somebody mentioned that when you lean forward, it may be a little bit better. Do you have uh, your audio coming from the built-in speaker? Uh, no, I'm, I'm using the yeah. headset. You can see that. Really well. All right, let's. Um, the segment's almost done. I'll be done very shortly. All right, guys. So. Uh, let's turn on the constellation art for a quick second again uh, to get you guys a little oriented. You know, we, we looked at a bunch of different constellations, um, and we'll, we have a fun exercise plan for you as well, uh, and we'll get to that in a quick second. It's something that we actually want you to do when you get out there tonight after the show, things that we want you to go ahead and find. I'm sure, you know, after what you've gone through or seen today, you should be able to get through some of that relatively very quickly. But as you learn about the night sky, what are some of the resources that you can really look at, right? You've got, you've got books, you've got star charts, you've got planoscares, right? Um, and of course, you've got apps as such. And then, of course, you've got another option to join SJAA. We're here to help, we're here, we're here to teach, we all teach each other. And that's how we get to learn and enjoy this hobby even more. So, now that said, let's go back to the, the deck and take a look at a couple of quick things. Of course, this is not to scale, but this is you know taking a very quick look at the orbits of our major planets. Uh, Jupiter takes about 12 years to go around um, the, the the sun. Uh, you know, Earth, of course, 365 days. So when you take a look at Jupiter taking 12 years and comparing the others, Mercury is at 88 days, Venus is at 225 days, Earth 365 days. We all know that. We live it. Uh, Mars about 687 days. Jupiter 12 years. Saturn 29 years. Uranus 84 years to make one orbit and Neptune 165 years. So in Jupiter years, I happen to be about three and a half years old. In Saturn years, I happen to be about just about a year and a half old. Uranus, I'm a half year old baby. And in Neptune years, I just passed my 50. On exercise, you know, we already talked about this, getting from Ursa Major or the Pan and Panhandle down to Polaris. Going over to Arcturus or arcing to Arcturus from the panhandle, spiking the spike up, and then finding your way down to Corona Borealis, that good smiley face in the night sky, down to Hercules, and then there you go. Now, of course, from Ursa Major, you can get to multiple other different locations in the night sky to other different constellations. You can get to Gemini uh, from the bottom of the pan, and if you go in the opposite direction of the point of stars, you can get to Leo Minor and the Major going Leo. You can also get down to Draco, and then there's another way. To get to your Hercules. But this is the 9 p.m. sky. So when you get out tonight around 10 30, 10 40 or so, the sky would have shifted a little bit, and this is pretty much what it would look like. Gemini would have gone down a little further more in the western horizon, and some more constellations would be coming up. So, hey, Rashi, I'm back. Hey, Carl, welcome back. Uh, we just are getting done with this segment. What did I miss? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, man. sorry about that. Khan should not have muted you, but it is what it is. I'm sure next time around uh, he will not. Um, but uh, I think we're pretty much at the end of the segment. One other thing, guys, you can do as uh, you're learning and you, know, you don't want to buy a plan sphere, you want other material, you can go to skymaps.com. You can download the evening sky map for the month for the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, and that will really help you 
very quickly get out there and start stargazing, learning your constellations and your major stars. All right, folks, now to Astro Gear. I'm going to head, uh, head over and uh, to, to monitor the YouTube uh, feed, but Conch is going to go ahead and, and walk you through some of the Astro Gear. Uh, don't worry, we're, we're still going to be around here. We'll be chiming in throughout the show. And of course, we'll be back um, with full presence uh, during the Q&A session. Over to you, Conch. All right. Uh, let me try to take over the screen for a second here. Uh, let's see. Is this showing? I'm waiting for it to show up here. All right, while we are waiting, uh, thank you very much for the great presentation, uh, Rashi. Uh, just a little bit unfortunate that uh, we had some audio problems we were trying to uh, fix, and uh, we did not realize that was Carl that was uh, that, that that I muted. Uh, sorry, Carl. Um, okay. Can you can you guys uh, see the my screen? It says. Uh, I'm yes, we can. Everyone. Yes, we can. Can you see the Astro Gear? We can see the Astro Gear. You probably want to move the other one out of the way. Yes. You thank go. you very much. Okay. Bye -bye. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, all right, so let's get to our next segment here. Uh, this is uh, Astro Gear. Uh, the reason we want to do that is uh, most of you are probably f uh, familiar with telescopes, and some of you probably already own um, uh, telescopes and astronomy gear. But in our uh, public star parties, we always find folks who had not seen a telescope or don't know how they work. So this is uh, a quick attempt to to uh, to fill that gap here. Um, so before I get to uh, astronomy gear, I want to kind of uh, well show this one here. That you can go and observe the sky. You can go out in the night sky. You can look up in your eyes, and and that's that's fine. But you can't really see a lot of details. So for, to that, you want to get assisted weaving, right? Um, so we have these uh, different uh, different instruments. You can use binoculars and different kind of refract uh, different kind of telescopes. Uh, I'll get to this uh, in uh, in a little bit more detail in the, in in the next next few slides, but before I get to the details, I want to kind of give you an analogy on you know why do you and how do we what a telescope works and you know why do we need one. Uh, let's assume that you are camping out and you are out of water and you're really thirsty and it's drizzling outside. You can go outside, you can look up, open your mouth, get whatever the drizzle you get, but uh, most of us will look for some other way to uh, collect water. So let's say you have a big bucket with an uh, opening on the top and, and a spout on the bottom. You can lift it up. Uh, you can collect all the water that you get, the drizzling, and let it funnel down to, to the spout, and you can control the amount of water you're drinking by controlling the spout. So take that analogy, and instead of having water, and I replace that with uh, um, uh, light, uh, light. So a drizzling light collection is what a telescope does. It collects the light, it funnels it, and let us control it. Now, every telescope that you can find, optical telescope, they all do the same same uh, uh, same function in different ways and different complexities. All the way from the small amateur telescope for uh, all the way up to uh, the uh, the professional telescope that you hear, the Hubble Space Telescope or the uh, uh, Mauna Kea Hawaii telescopes and whatnot. Going backwards. So, the the light. So I want to tie this in the light, right? So I, I mentioned that uh, instead of water, you take light. So the way that it works is like, let's say you go outside to the dark, dark sky site and you look up, and your eyes, your pupils of your eyes are letting in um, all the drizzling lights from this far away object. They're really dim light, uh, and you're only letting in about maybe five millimeters worth of light in each of your eyes. That's like having two little straws. You know, feeding that that drizzling light to you. Instead of doing that, you can use a telescope to gather gather a lot more light and and concentrate it and and get it into your eyes. So, out of the telescopes, these type of telescopes that I mentioned, one of the things that's really common is binoculars. Binoculars is a great object, a uh, great instrument to have. It's they are cheap, they are very portable, and uh, they are very versatile. You don't have to. This is a pair that I have here. And uh, even amateurs and, and professional astronomers, they all have, uh, you know, they you, we all have binoculars. It's really useful. So I'll encourage you to go, uh, you know, try to find one, or maybe you may have one somewhere uh, in your cupboard. You can use this for astronomy as long as they're not too small. 
And this kind of binoculars are very, very handy. You can, um, you can you know, hand hold it and you can look at a lot, lot of objects with this one. Um, and I found, happened to find uh, uh, the binoculars are generally uh, made with lenses and prisms. So in the front, there's a lens that are prisms to, to bend the light. So this is like a handheld binocular that I'm showing here. But then also I found one of these ones is like a gigantic binocular. So you, you can't really hold this with your hands, but you can have a mount uh, that's uh, holding the binoculars. And this is kind of funny. This person had a armchair here. He's doing his armchair observing with a real binoculars here. And the next one I want to show is uh, refracting telescopes. The refracting telescopes are these kind of long, uh, thin tubes uh, that you would see no more than you know three to five inches in uh, diameter. Um, and a telltale sign to see that's a refracting telescope is if you look in the front of the telescope, you would see a lens on here. So they use lenses mainly uh, to collect and bend the light. And I will go quickly and tell you how this works here. And here's a picture that I found from a NASA website. This is not really an accurate representation. Uh, hold on a second, I'm getting messages. Let me turn off my messages. Um, this is not really an accurate representation of uh, a real right part, but it gives a, a, an analogy of how the light travels through a telescope, refracted telescopes. Refractive telescope here, the light's coming from far away object and uh, they enter the telescope. And so, you know, now this is the, the big barrel of uh, you know, light collection barrel here. And they go through, the light goes through a uh, lens and the lens uh, bends the light and let it collect to a point and what we call a focus. So the focus the light to a point. So that's one part of the telescope. The other part of the telescope is to take that collected light and allow it to be magnified by this uh, the secondary uh, lens component. It's generally not one lens. Uh, it's uh, what we call it the eyepiece. It's actually a stack of lenses in here. So, um, and you can you can you can focus this light you, by moving this this part of the telescope. Just like how, if you want to, uh, this is really magnif magnification. So if you want to magnify something, so here I have a magnifying glass. If I want to magnify something, I would just move the glass back and forth like this. Just like that, uh, you can move this little piece back and forth and th that does the magnification. Why do you want to do these two things? The first one you want to do, collect a lot of light, is because you see those dim objects your eye cannot resolve otherwise. So that's why you want to collect the light and concentrate it. Why do you want to magnify it? You want to magnify it because some objects, like uh, let's say, for, for example, you can look at the moon. For the moon, you don't really need to collect a lot of light. Uh, you can see the moon if you just go look up. However, you can really see the details of the moon. In order to see the details of the moon, you want to magnify or zoom into it. And that's what this magnification part of the telescope does. So this is uh, how a refractive telescope works. And I'm going to move on to this, oops, uh, the next type of telescopes. These are reflecting telescopes. They generally use mirrors to collect light. Uh, one way to recognize this in the field when you go to star party is they tend to be wider in diameter and also uh, fairly long. And uh, these two pictures, they are not to scale. The one on the right hand side is a, uh, what I would call is a desktop or a tabletop version of a telescope. It's about six inch in diameter, not that long, uh, very portable. And then you also see like this, this other telescope on the left hand side is, uh, is probably a, you know more than five feet tall um, and, and they have a probably even larger mirror. So you can see if you go to an observing session, if you see just, just big telescope, big wide telescopes, you can assume that that's a reflecting type. So the way these things work, I don't want to go to too much details, but I'll show a picture here. Uh, just like the other picture I, sh I showed in the refractor where there's a lens on the top, the reflector here, uh, instead of the lens, it has a mirror that actually turns the light and concentrates the light. So that's how they operate. Okay, moving on to the third kind you might see in, in uh, a star party is called the compound telescope. So, so this takes both mirrors and lenses. Uh, a telltale sign uh, to of these kind of telescopes is they tend to be you know fairly wide in 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 diameter. They also tend to be very short because they bend light inside. And also you can notice that in the very front they also have a lens. So they have a lens in the front. They happen to have mirror in the back and then some other optical elements in between. So that's how these telescopes uh, look like. And they're called uh, catadioptic or uh, compound telescopes. Lastly, 
one more thing I want to show out is this collapsible telescopes. Uh, in certain star parties, especially if you go to dark sky star parties, you will see some large telescopes people bring in, and they tend to be like this, this monstrous, uh, you know, big ones with uh, uh, poles attached to it. Uh, they, are, they are really uh, reflector telescopes that I showed here. Um, there's a tube. If you, if you look at this tube and take away the tube, and that's how it looks like inside. There's a mirror down here, and, uh, and there's a secondary part. This, this, uh, this, this is where you put the eye, and it's all held, held with this, uh, this, uh, this metal strusses. So they can come in like all metal or wood and metal kind of combinations. The beauty of these things is you can collapse these things, and you can carry very heavy telescopes uh, easily and assemble it on flight. I would recommend uh, watching somebody, an astronomer, setting one of these telescopes together in, in a star party uh, when, you, when you guys get to go to one next time, and it's a nice sight to see. OK, uh, eyepieces. I kind of mentioned about eyepieces. Eyepieces is the this last thing. And if you take this refractor, there is a uh, an optical element at the end. That's called the eyepiece. Uh, this is used for magnification. So here's a picture that I found online that shows like a collection of eyepieces. And these are kind of things that you would see uh, when you go to a star party, you will hear an astronomer saying, oh, I'm going to switch my eyepieces. Um, in, in, in a second, I'll actually demo this thing uh, to you. But um, you can change these eyepieces to get uh, different levels of magnification that you need, depending on uh, what you're looking at and the condition of the sky and whatnot. So here's a quick uh, demo on where the uh, quick uh, illustration of where the eyepieces go. So this refractor telescope is at the very end. This is where you put your eye. And the reflector telescope, the eyepiece uh, tend to be in, in the top of the telescope here. OK. And before we get to the armchair observing, I want to quickly show, let me see whether the video works well. All right, quickly show, this is a refractor. This is what I was talking about. And in the front, we have the lens here. You can, well, it's a, the lens is back down here. This is just a shield. So there's a lens down here. And at the very back here, you can see uh, the eyepiece here. Actually, the eyepiece can be taken out, and I can put a different eyepiece. Uh, by the way, um, here are two eyepieces. You can see the size difference. There are small ones or big ones. They're doing the exact same uh, function. Actually, these two happen to be doing the same level of magnification, but they are designed to do different different uh, things and uh, provide you a different level of uh, weaving. So that's why there is a difference in uh, you know size and weight. Um, what else? Oh, I want to show this one. This is what I mentioned about the eyepiece, the focusing. So you can see there's a knob here. And when you rotate this, the eyepiece go back and forth. And that allows the telescopes to come to focus. So the, the light coming from the front gets get into a focus back down here. And they, they travel backwards more. And uh, once you move this back and forth, you get the right focus. And you can look uh, by putting your eye here. And this part here is the mount of the telescope. There are different types of mounts. Uh, we are not going to go through that uh, here in this talk, but uh, essentially what the mount does is actually elevate the telescope and let, let you uh, point to an object that you want to see. Uh, a good example to say is that let's say you want to find Venus. So these days the Venus sets uh, uh, at, at sunset time, so it's uh, west. So you go outside and you rotate your body to find where west is, and you go look up and down and to see the bright object Venus. You can do it with the telescope. You can rotate back and forth, and you can go upside, up and down until you find Venus, and then look, look up in here. And the only differences you might see in the field is there could be a telescope that has electronics and, elect, uh, and uh, motor-driven tracking. This is the one, as you see, that I can manipulate with my hands. The reason you want to have some tracking and motors is because um, the, uh, the Earth is rotating, and uh, if you're looking at an object through a telescope, uh, you're really zooming into a small piece of the, of the sky, and the object you're looking at is going to move out of the way unless you keep moving. And if you have tracking, it's very easy to track something and not having to move the telescope around. So those are the kind of little basics about how the telescopes are, um, uh, operate and what kind of telescopes are out there. Um, if you have, there's, there's a lot of information on this field, and you might see some other telescopes in the, in the next segment uh, that, that our images are using. If you have questions, just send it uh, to Q&A, and we can try to answer them. Thank you very much. So the next section is uh, Bruce um, and Glenn. Take it away, please. OK, yeah, if you could advance this. I'm going to need you to do the first couple slides, and then we'll switch. OK, I'll do that.
All right, so uh, because we can't all uh, go and look in telescopes tonight and and potentially uh, you know brush our eyelids across eyepieces and share uh, something we don't want to share, uh, we're going to do some astrophotography uh, and we'll give you some live views uh, of the night sky here in a minute and uh, just talk about uh, there's a couple of us that are going to be doing that and uh, this is my uh, telescope at home here it's a, a 12 inch uh, re reflector it's it's a Ritchie Criteon is the type it's the same optical design as the Hubble uh, Space Telescope and most modern observatories uh, use that type of an optical design it's a semi-permanent uh, setup so I don't I don't move this anywhere, and I can sit in my uh, office inside the house, or uh, you know get it going and then go to bed, and it'll continue to do do its thing. Uh, and uh, that works by there's a, a local com computer out on the telescope that connects back into the house with Wi-Fi, and then uh, again, uh, if you want to know more about the astrophotography aspect, uh, you know we have SJAA has an event. Um, tomorrow night uh, that's more about deep space imaging and we'll go into this in more detail but on the right there you can see a close-up of the I call it the instrument package on this on this telescope so there's actually a couple different cameras there and a filter wheel and a rotator and a focuser and all the kind of stuff that that uh, we need so this is my rig and I think on the next slide if you could advance uh, we have a, a little different setup can we go to the next slide? Glenn, uh, is there an image that you can pop up for yourself so the folks can see who's speaking? Yes, I can. Thank you for reminding me to do that. Okay, we're still hoping. There we go. Okay, so Bruce uh, is on the call as well. He can jump in anytime here. Uh, and uh, this is Bruce's rig. And so this is. Uh, uh, refractor type of telescope and it's a, a 152 millimeter objective and uh, this is a, a portable setup um, so he can take this to dark sites and uh, there in the that tub at the bottom he's got a, a computer and a Wi-Fi router and then he can control that from another laptop or an iPad or, or what have you and then on the right again we've got a similar uh, set up his uh, imaging train or, or instrument package happens to be very similar to, to mine so there's a couple cameras and a filter wheel and a focal reducer and a focuser and a rotator and all kinds of stuff there so um, that just gives you an idea of uh, the equipment that we're going to be using here in just a second and uh, let me uh, grab hold of the presentation. I think if you go one more slide, just to remind me that, that where we're going from here. OK, never mind. I will grab it. Okay, and all right, so um, we're back out at, at RCDO here in Stellarium, and we're looking to the north. If you've been there uh, physically, you're probably used to looking to the to the south here. The, the telescope's usually set up along this, uh, this rail, and then they can look in different directions, but you're probably used to looking out across this field. Uh, but I want to bring your attention back to the to the north here, and um, and the north star uh, Polaris, because uh, Conch talked a little bit about tracking. Um, you know, if I change the time of day, you see how the constellations are wheeling around this one part of the sky here. So this is the Polaris, the North Star, and in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, everything kind of wheels around that. So that's a good point to, to uh, be oriented towards. So we'll, 
we'll use that. And let's go ahead and, and take a look at some images in the, in the night sky here. So the first thing that we're going to look at is uh, M3. So let me talk about that. So M3 is a globular cluster. Uh, and it's sort of like a, a mini ancient uh, galaxy in a way. They happen to be associated with galaxies and they sort of orbit up and down through the galaxy. Uh, but you can see here that, that uh, th th this one particular has uh, as many as 500,000 uh, stars in it. And what we're looking at here is a, a star chart uh, Rashi talked about before if you've got a telescope with the, uh, a Telrad uh, viewfinder on it, then you can see the same uh, object in your, in your viewfinder, this reticle, and then you can get oriented in the sky uh, with that, and that'll help you find this object. So uh, this object is uh, in the uh, constellation of the hunting dogs. I won't try to pronounce the Latin. Uh, anybody can jump in here if you want to. <laughs> um, so first, we're looking at Polaris. OK, and so then we'll jump over to the hunting dog constellation. And then center on M3. And we'll zoom in. And this is uh, an, an astro image of M3 that uh, Paul Mahoney, Mahaney uh, took. And uh, I don't think we have him on the call. Is that right? Did he ever join the call? Paul is out at his observatory right now. OK. Thank you, Bruce. All right, so uh, we can go ahead and show. So this is his uh, image of M3 mapped onto the, to the sky. Uh, if we look at that in a, in a slide, uh, you can see here, this is uh, he, he, a homemade uh, six inch Newtonian that, that he built. And that's what he imaged this with. And uh, again, we talked about this is a, a globular cluster in the hunt, hunting dogs constellation. It's about 35,000 light years away. Um, so with that, let me drag something over and we'll actually get kind of a live look here. So we're, as astrophotographers, we're used to doing sort of long exposures of the night sky. That's another way to get more light in your, in your funnel, in your, in your camera sensor, is to, is to use a long exposure. Uh, and we also tend to use monochrome cameras. So what you're looking at here, uh, and I promise I'll keep this part brief, but um, you know, I'm taking 30-second uh, uh, exposures uh, through red, green, and uh, uh, blue filters. And so, you know, one of these monochrome I images is going to look something like that. But uh, I do have the ability to do something called live stacking. Uh, so we can show you by combining those red, green, and blue uh, monochrome images. Here's uh, a, a live image of that M3 globular cluster. And so hopefully this feels somewhat like uh, looking through a telescope at, out at, uh, at RCDO. All right. Get this out of the way. Let's go and check out another object. So we'll zoom back out from uh, M3 and the hunting dogs constellation and get reoriented on, on Polaris. And I've labeled here the M3 you saw go by. So we'll know uh, as we add more objects, as we look at more objects, they'll be labeled and we can see where they are in the sky. So here we are back at uh, RCDO uh, looking north again. And let's go ahead and go to our next object, which will be uh, M44, which is an, uh, 
what's called an open cluster. It's also called the beehive cluster. And again, we have the, the star chart here to tell you how to find it in the sky. And uh, if you're looking with a, with a naked eye, you know, you might be able to see this as a fuzzy spot. Uh, but if you have like a six inch telescope, then you'll start to see uh, many tens of stars. And uh, this object is, is pretty large, so you might even be best uh, viewed with binoculars. Okay, so let's, uh, M44 is in Cancer. So let's zoom over to the constellation of Cancer and then get oriented on M44 and zoom in. Okay, and uh, you see there a satellite going by in the in the planetarium program. The planetarium programs are, are accurate models of the, the night sky and they include things like satellites and comets and whatnot. So this is an image uh, by Francesco and I believe we have Francesco on the line. Uh, are yes. you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yep. Can did you have anything so you wanted a, to say? <laughs> that I took from, uh, uh, yeah. So the uh, we don't need uh, we don't not always need to go to very dark places in order to take pictures. This one was taken from my home balcony in Mountain View, and I exposed uh, for a total of one hour and captured probably a good amount uh, of the stars of this cluster. As you can see, some of them are. Uh, uh, this in general, this cluster is made up of very young stars, about 600 million uh, <clears throat> years, which is nothing in, uh, in astronomical terms. Some of them are still uh, very much blue because they are young stars, big stars, and they burn very hot. And so they, their color is, uh, is uh, shifted towards blue. Some of them have already transitioned to become uh, red giants which despite the name appear more yellowish and orange to our, to our eyes. This is a, a cluster that was known since uh, ancient times. People were not, uh, didn't know what it was. They thought it was a, some a fuzzy patch in the heart of, uh, of the Cancer constellation. But then when, uh, when Galileo Galilei got his, uh, his first telescope and trained it to the sky, he could see that it was actually made of stars. Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, Bruce, uh, if you're on the line, I think you uh, were doing some live stacking of... Uh... Yeah. Let me share my screen. Okay. Get my stuff out of the way here while you're switching over. You guys see that? Yeah, we see it. Okay. Um, this is the beehive cluster, uh, which unfortunately just dipped behind a tree, but I've been live stacking for the past hour or so. I have over 100 frames, uh, 30 seconds each going through a green filter. Uh, my software does not have the capability that Glenn's does to do stacking and, uh, you know, combination of color filters on the, on the uh, fly. But um, this is a uh, you know, nice monochrome image of the beehive cluster. Okay, and I'm trying to get ready for the next uh, image while people are talking here is why there's a hesitation. So um, I think I will go ahead and let's move on to the to the next image. Uh, I'm going to take back the screen, Bruce. Okay. Let's get Stellarium back over here. Okay, so we're zooming out from uh, M44. 
and we'll get reoriented on uh, Polaris. Okay, the next object we want to look at is M97. And I'm just juggling through windows here. So M97 is a planetary nebula, and as Rashi said earlier, uh, that's kind of a, a misnomer. They're, they're not actually associated with, with planets, but people saw them as small, bright objects, so they thought maybe they were, they were planets. Um, this one is, uh, as you can see there, it's at the bottom of the, the Big Dipper, and uh, because it's close to the, to, uh, the North Star, relatively close, uh, you know, this is uh, visible for most of the year. And uh, let's go ahead and take a look at that. So the big, so we zoom over to uh, Ursa Major is where the Big Dipper is, and then we'll get oriented on M97 and zoom in. And uh, this is an image of, of M97 Planetary Nebula by Paulo. And uh, we have Paulo on the line. Paulo? Uh, yeah, I'm here. OK. And there's a picture of your telescope rig, too. What can you tell us about uh, this image? Uh, well, uh, that's another example of what you can do from uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. From the city, because uh, that uh, that image has been uh, uh, from done from me from uh, my backyard that I'm living in a situation even worse that uh, the Francesco was mentioning before. If you remember the Rashi uh, slice uh, picture of all the sky, I am on the leftmost, uh, so brightmost. Uh, uh, sky possible and uh, that was uh, two uh, night uh, exposure on two different filters i don't want to enter in uh, in particular here but was uh, 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 basically a red filter the hydrogen and the green blue filter and the oxygen and uh, a combined uh, uh, Im these combined images has been uh, made with uh, uh, 64 total uh, images uh, of uh, five minutes each with uh, for a total of uh, five and a half hour of exposure so not uh, not particularly long exposure and that is a a global cluster as uh, um, sorry, sorry a planetary nebula as rashi was uh, mentioning before that is 2000 uh, uh, light years uh, far from uh, us and uh, uh, nothing that is uh, is quite uh, quite a complex uh, uh, structure that is the various uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, a level of various bubbles, uh, one inside the other, that form these kind of patterns that have been called uh, the Howl Nebula, because uh, the first uh, um, observer that they discovered that in the 1781, at the time of uh, Messier, was a colleague of Messier that discovered this. And, uh, uh, and after that, uh, they, they look at these two uh, black spot and was looking like uh, the too big uh, high of a howl and so they call it of course howl nebula okay great thank you for that let's uh move on so we're gonna zoom back out from the owl nebula and get reoriented on Polaris. And let's go take a look at a galaxy. Let's look at the pinwheel galaxy, uh, M101. 
So this is something that you can see with uh, binoculars as a dim patch of light. Uh, if you've got a little bigger telescope, uh, then you can see some of the nebulosity uh, around the, the core of the galaxy. Uh, and if you've got uh, an eight inch scope, uh, you can see, uh, you can really see the, the uh, galaxy here like we'll show you in a, in a minute, uh, although not maybe not with all the colors. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. Uh, M101 is in the same constellation as M97. It's in uh, Ursa Major or the Great Bear. So let's take a look at that. So back to Ursa Major. Get oriented on the pinwheel galaxy. Zoom in. Okay, and this image was actually taken by a couple of club members who were in high school at the time. I'm guessing they're in, in college now. Um, and this is a, a pretty iconic uh, a galaxy. And uh, they took this, um, I believe, in, the, in their backyard location with this uh, telescope here. And this is a, a classical spiral galaxy, uh, as we said, in Ursa Major, 20 million light years away. Um, Bruce, are you able to, to show anything live of uh, the pinwheel galaxy? If you're talking, Bruce, you're muted. Hi, yeah, uh, I just okay. unmuted. Um, I, I am uh, working on getting the live stack working on it. Just a, another minute, and I'll be. Ready. All right. Um, maybe one of the uh, Carl or Rashi or um, Conch want to jump in here for a minute and with some galaxy facts while we're waiting for Bruce or. Um, okay, let me uh, let me take the screen. Okay, go oh, ahead. Okay. I was just going to say that, you know, we did talk about galaxies a little earlier, and they do come in different shapes and sizes, right? So what we are seeing here is a spiral galaxy, but they do come in elliptical, irregular, and barred elliptical, sorry, uh, spiral, barred spiral, elliptical, and irregular um, uh, forms or patterns. Um, and you can go online and take a look. There's just a massive myriad of, uh, of types of galaxies. Um, and of course, different sizes as well. It's fascinating. So uh, folks, you should definitely uh, look online and, and read up some more and look at some of the pictures. Back to you, Bruce. Okay. Um, okay, so I've been live stacking just for a minute and uh, this is uh, M101. Uh, let me uh, green filter. <laughs> get out of your way here. Okay, go ahead. Uh, as at, when we live stack, it, it keeps adding frame on top of frame and the signal to noise ratio gets better and better as time goes on. So uh, this is 11 frames right now and uh, it gets less noisy generally, <laughs> but it also uh, sometimes acts up and changes. It's what we call screen stretch, which is what you guys are seeing right here. So just uh, chalk that up to a technical difficulty for the moment. Hey Bruce, this is this is absolutely amazing what we're able to see. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing for the amount of time that it took to get a very dim celestial object like this to come up. Mm -hmm. um, I I have just really start getting into this live stacking thing. And um, it's pretty amazing that I can do this from my suburban backyard in San Jose. Yeah, that's mind blowing. Yeah. Even from a telescope, we can see these objects uh, and, and barely make out, even from a dark site, we can barely make out the, uh, the spirals. And now here from Bruce's backyard with a little bit of uh, uh, integrating. Integrating is uh, Bruce. You can. You got anybody talked about integration or 
Did I miss that? I did a, a little bit. I didn't use the word integration, but I talked about long exposures is what we normally do to collect more light on our camera sensors. Right, so we have the, the advantage first of the telescope itself, as you talked about concentrating the light, but then we can also see more than the eye could see through telescope by taking long exposures. And, and that's referred to integration or the total time that you take uh, exposures and then add them all together uh, can be considered integration, yeah. yeah. So Bruce, uh, can you repeat again, like how long did, did you uh, collect this uh, image from? <clears throat> Uh, this is for this is 15 30 second frames right now and um, <clears throat> um, I have another from a couple nights ago I did about 50 or 60 frames each of red green and blue and <clears throat> I'm just started really playing around with it as far as the processing goes when you're doing astrophotography uh, you spend easily as much time in the processing after you've taken all your images, uh, as you do actually collecting images, um, it's it's a you know a detail oriented thing, and uh, there's a lot to it. Um, it's getting easier. There's some great software out there, and uh, a lot of people are are getting a lot of enjoyment out of doing it. Yeah, and they, Bruce, they, go ahead, Bruce, Paolo. Can I can I can I say a word about what we are seeing uh, just to have uh, the perspective? Uh, sure. All the stars that we are seeing uh, are all stars that we are that are in our galaxy, that are yeah. between uh, us and the galaxy that you are imaging. Normally, you cannot see star in the galaxy unless they are supernova. So they are bright flash of explosion. Normally, you cannot see. You, you see only this kind of uh, um, fuzzy nebulosity or whatever you want to call that are big aggregation of star formation or star already formed. But all the stars that you see are in the between. And like returning to, to, for instance, to my uh, image before, also the... Um, the planetary nebula and basically all the nebula are our neighborhood in the galaxy between us and other star, but not in other galaxies. That's correct. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I can move on to the next image if uh, or object, Bruce. If you're, are you done with? Uh... Well, give it back to you. Okay. There you go. All right. Um, so let me do that for the meet and also do this for the YouTube. All right. So again, we'll zoom back out uh, away from our buddy M101 there. And I want to show you one more object um, so you can see these labels in red here. This is where we've been uh, in the night sky. We've been up to M3 and over to M44 and M97 and M101. I want to take you one place that's really, uh, I'm cheating a little bit because it's not really uh, high enough in the sky to, to image anymore, but I really wanted to show you uh, a bright, uh, nebula, uh, an emission nebula, uh, and because that's my particular uh, joy of, of imaging those types of objects. So we're going to look at something called the Rosette Nebula. So let's do that. And uh, as I said, uh, this this chart here with the with the green lines with the gaps in it, this this is uh, telling you. Uh, it's, you probably can't read the months here, but these are months across the bottom. So this is uh, May right here and April. So we're really uh, beyond uh, what uh, good time to, to image this nebula. And these, the reason there are gaps here is that's when the, when the moon's up. So you need a, a new moon or, or uh, you know, the moon needs to be farther away uh, from, the, from the nebula in order to do a good job of, of imaging it. 
so this is uh, in the constellation of uh, Monoceros. And uh, this is a pretty wide field object. You need a, a low magnification or wide field uh, eyepiece to take a look at that. And uh, the other thing this slide talks about is, um, you know, this is an example of, of, of something that, that you're only going to see in this rich color in an astrophoto. Uh, your eye just can't collect enough light uh, fast enough to see these uh, some of these colors. So let's go ahead and move on. So we'll go to uh, first to the constellation of uh, Monoceros. And then we'll get oriented on the Rosette Nebula, also called NGC 2237. And uh, this image was taken by uh, club member John Wainwright. Uh, we don't have him on the phone tonight, but here's a closer view of that. And again, so this this is an, an emission nebula in uh, Monoceros or the unicorn. And here at the bottom left is a picture of the rig that that John used to take this photo. Uh, and I bet uh, either Francesco or Paolo probably have some interesting comments about uh, emission nebula maybe or <laughs> I didn't warn them about this but well the, the emission nebula uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> why they call it emission because uh, normally are uh, uh, reflecting uh, uh, clouds of uh, gas from uh, in a that reflect admission from star and so the star uh, let's say energy emitted from the from the star is uh, exciting the gas and the gas uh, like uh, the gas in our neon tube when uh, is energized by this energy uh, start to admit light and so what, what we are seeing is that light that uh, is emitted by the, by the, by the gas. And uh, uh, the in interesting things are the, the black part or the, the, the dark part that are normally more dense uh, uh, cluster of gas and particles and normally those are called the uh, star nursery because uh, in these places, in this, uh, uh, let's say, cluster of matter, there will be new star born because uh, gravity will start to, uh, uh, let's say, um, call together the, the, the matter and that will form in the future new stars and and those new stars will be uh, bright blue as francesco was saying because they are a baby star a young star and they are burning very um very hot and so they will be on very bright okay and paulo uh, you want to tell a little bit about the color here uh, the red color well, the red color normally is uh, uh, because uh, the the red color is, uh, let's say, different uh, uh, gas, uh, different particles uh, emit different color. Again, uh, continuing to the the same analogy of the neon tube. Think about a neon uh, signage. They have different color the tube because there are different gases inside uh, particularly the red one is the uh, hydrogen or the sulfur that both are uh, admitting in the uh, red band uh, instead for instance uh, um, hydrogen is uh, green blue sorry uh, oxygen is green blue 
And so you can understand what kind of uh, um, gas is uh, there studying the color. And that is uh, one branch of astrophotography that's called uh, um, spectroscopy. And that's a study of not only the, the nebula, but also the, the, um, uh, the star that uh, study the composition of the star and the nebula studying the, uh, the, the admission of the light. Okay, uh, here I see another picture uh, of, of Rosette Nebula, very dramatic and very beautiful from my point of view. Uh, one, field, um, one note of all the images. All the images that you can see, the, all the best images that you can see about uh, Hubble, uh, telescope, uh, this and the other, are all false color because are a composition of a, a very narrow color band that are, uh, let's say, um, creating a, a pleasant color and pleasant composition to our eyes of uh, the, the, those few little band of color put together. So when you see this, uh, this uh, this picture that you have on the screen right now with all that blue part inside and uh, uh, orange uh, uh, around uh, and and you see the previous one that are all red those are because the the two images are um, let's say processes in different way uh, enhancing the different color so uh, for the point of view of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, of beauty for the, for, of the picture are very interesting. For the point of view of science and study, uh, these are all, uh, let's say, not completely important because uh, there are what they call false color. So all our subject, each, each one of us can uh, uh, tweak the color and elaborate the color in a different way. There is no real color of the Rosette Nebula because right. the real color of Rosette Nebula is basically red. But I, I would our... add that, and, and then we'll move, move on here, but I would add yeah. that, you know, using uh, these filters to bring out the different uh, spectrums, the different uh, gases, right? So this blue is going to represent the the doubly ionized oxygen, and the yellow is probably uh, singly ionized uh, sulfur. And then in in this image, and the red in both images is probably uh, hydrogen, right? So it it does have a scientific value in terms of of uh, understanding the different the different structures uh, yes, in the uh, in the nebula. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but just, just just one one point. Uh, the point is that uh, we are, um, let's say, mapping the different uh, uh, admission. So the the diff, the uh, uh, hydrogen or oxygen, this and the other, on different color. If we map the hydrogen to blue, uh, there will be a completely different right. uh, different color. Yeah, um, guys, can I share an image real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, this is uh, share this. And again, if you're interested in in astrophotography, uh, you know, there's a session tomorrow night. Uh, it's on Meetup. Uh, yeah, Starless. Yeah. This this is also the Rosette Nebula, which yeah. is also yeah. one of my favorite targets for astrophotography and um this is as glenn just said it's a starless version of it um, there are ways that you can use software to remove the stars from images and stars are great but uh sometimes removing the stars from an image reveals some more detail in, in the clouds of nebulosity uh, this image uh, i took from suburban backyard using narrowband filters that eliminate the uh, the light pollution pretty much completely 
and uh, it is uh, what they call SHO, sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen three uh, uh, imaging, where you're substituting, as they were saying, substituting uh, uh, colors uh, for the red, green, and blue using different filters. And uh, the, you know, as we've been talking about this, this is a different uh, false color, but uh, the Hubble palette is uh, is what it's called actually uh in general and uh, i believe that they started doing it on the hubble space telescope because they, they were able to bring out detail using the hubble palette and and the substitution and false color that they used uh better than using uh you know the the normal red green and blue by substituting so just thought i'd share that all right thanks guys that was great um Let's go ahead and go back to our night sky here. Um, I guess I should present this as well for the folks on the meet up or on the meet. Sorry, resume. Okay. All right. So zoom back out from the rosette nebula and we'll see now see it's uh, underneath the uh, the ground is why you don't see any constellations there so at this uh, time of year that object is too low to image but again you can see where we've been tonight in the in the night sky from the from the viewpoint of rcdo uh, again, we started at, at M44, we went over to M97, uh, oh, we started at M3, sorry, M3 to M44 to M97 to M101, and then I couldn't help but throw in uh, this object, the, the rosette, even though it's below the, the horizon, just to give you a good variety of, of objects. Okay, uh, I think that's it for the this session or this uh sorry this section of the of the show so let me go ahead and take it back uh Kancha rashi yeah let me uh take this uh, rashi do you uh would you like to do the uh the fun exercise oh we can go over it again i think um, yeah uh we can go over it again quickly um yeah sure not a problem and then um let me go and do that let's so while Rashi is bringing it up, I just want to mention that we are running a little bit late, folks. So just hang out, uh, hang out a little bit more. Uh, we are going to get to the question and answer session uh, in a few minutes here. All right. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yes. Uh, we're back at the night sky. We're at about 10.30, so we're actually a little behind in time. So it's about 10.53 p.m. Uh, Pacific. But, you know, we're not that off. Um, when, you, when you get out there and take a look at the night sky, We'll do a very quick recap of some of the things that you know we, we would definitely want you to do when you, when you get back out there. Uh, you find the pan and the panhandle, which is the asterism in Ursa Major. And then using the pointer stars, Marak and Dube, you can actually make your way down to Polaris, the North Pole Star, which is the tail star of Ursa Minor. If you go in the opposite direction, you can get to Leo Minor and Leo. From the panhandle, you can arc to Arcturus in Bootes, and then spike to Spica in Virgo. Come back to Arcturus and then trace out this kite pattern and you'll find that Arcturus is that streamer or tail star of this kite pattern, uh, which, you know, the constellation we call Bootes. And then going from Arcturus down towards Vega, the hop star, you will actually cut right through Corona Borealis, which is a bunch of stars that look like a smiley face, which is the Northern Crown. And then you'll go to the Keystone of Hercules. And why does it call the Keystone? Primarily because, as you all know, the Keystone of an archway is that main stone up in the center. If you take that out, uh, the, the entire archway falls. So please be careful. Do not remove the Keystone of Hercules. It actually holds up the entire night sky. Otherwise, the night sky will fall on us. No, just kidding. Don't worry about that. Uh, and then you get through Hercules, and then you will get down to Vega. Now, by the time you get out there, you're probably going to see another star coming up above the horizon, uh, and that is Deneb in Cygnus, Cygnus the Swan. And we'll Sorry, Rashid, the audio got cut off a little bit. Talk about the angle starts to become a lot more 
prominent. Um, where did you guys lose me? Uh, just uh, go back five seconds. <laughs> that helped. <laughs> Three, one. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So um, below Vega, we are starting to see the summer triangle. You know, Vega is part of it. Uh, Cygnus coming up, Cygnus to Swan. We've got Deneb, and we'll talk about the summer triangle in a few weeks. Um, also from Ursa Major, you can make your way to Gemini, the Gemini twins. Uh, you can also then above the Gemini twins, you will find Cancer. So, uh, you know, get out there, um, use a planetary app on your phone, uh, go to skymaps.com, download uh, the sky maps, print it out, get outside and learn your constellations. Cheers, guys. Back to you, Kanch. Thank you, Rashi. All right. So let me do the resume presentation here. Uh, let's wait for it to come back up here. Great. Thanks, Rashi. Thanks, Glenn and team. Um, and uh, I'm just waiting for my screen to appear. It's trying to take over. We are going to go to the Q&A session here. Uh, Sukada and Amy, I think, collected a few questions. If you have any questions, Sukada. Yeah. Hi, guys. So great presentation, by the way, all of you. Uh, so we had a few interesting questions come in the chat channel. Uh, but most of them have been answered already. So do we want to go over them or do we actually want to uh, give our audience a chance to ask some last minute questions they might have uh, apart from the ones that have not already been answered in the chat channel? I think the audience can write uh, a few more questions if they have. Uh, if there's one or two questions that you think it's probably important to uh, say it loud here or, or basically uh, that we can expand upon. Uh, let's bring them up here. Okay. Uh, let's see. There was a long discussion about astrophotography, and Francesco already answered some of that. So I will skip past that. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is an interesting question. We see red stars, orange stars, yellow stars, and blue stars. Why no green stars out there? This was asked by Nancy. I believe it has to do something with the cones in the back of your eyes. Not an eye doctor that I can tell you exactly, but I think you that, want me to try to that might be it. Uh, sure, yeah. Sure, Francesca. Yeah. So the um, green is a perfectly valid color, of course, in the universe. <clears throat> the if you if you emit radiation with a wavelength. Uh, of about uh, 500 nanometers, it's gonna be green. The problem is that stars don't emit that way. They don't, uh, they don't emit light in one particular wavelength. They follow Planck's law, i.e. They, they emit a, a, a spectrum, a continuous spectrum of radiation following a very precise law. So even a star that has uh, the, the maximum emission in uh, in a wavelength corresponding to the green color, has so much other emission nearby in the in the orange and um, and blue and uh, and red portions of the spectrum that our eyes integrate that as a yellow color. That's what we see. Our um, that's why we're seeing uh, yellow stars. It is different for nebulae. So a nebula like the the owl nebula that we saw, the the gases there are so rarefied, the density is so low, that instead of emitting a continuous spectrum, you actually get one particular wavelength, a, a line spectrum, we call it. And uh, it may happen that the particular chemical species that are being excited by the radiation, like uh, oxygen, for instance, have uh, an emission line uh, in the green portion of the spectrum. And so you can see nebulae having green colors, but not stars because of the way stars, of the laws that uh, starlight emission follows. That's pretty cool. Thank you, Francesco. Uh, so one more question that just Michael asked uh, is, what are the top three objects or events you would like to observe in the next So Sukada, we cannot hear you. Oh, sorry. Do you want me to um, I can ask a question. Yeah, go ahead, Amy. What, uh, Michael Madden asks, what are the top three objects or events you'd like to observe in the next month?
All right, anyone want to take that question? We actually didn't hear the question. I pre I think. Yeah. What are the top three? If, uh, what are the <coughs> what are the top three um, objects or events you'd like to objects? observe in, or or events you'd like to observe in the next month? Top three objects for the next month. Or events. Uh, um, M13, the big globular cluster in uh, in Hercules. And uh, if you want to wait a little bit uh, later, uh, the planet Jupiter, it's always a show. And then uh, the Milky Way. The Milky Way is just uh, starting to rise uh, in the east uh, around uh, maybe 10.30 PM right now. Next month, it, it's going to rise earlier. And uh, if you have a chance of go to go to a nice uh, dark site please do that the the milky way is amazing from uh, from a dark site can i add also uh to the fact that we talk about vega uh, near vega there is m57 that's uh, a nice planetary nebula the ring nebula mm -hmm. and that's another object that you can observe also with uh, relatively little telescope yeah. and i think i think the in, in june itself we've got uh, a couple of eclipses coming our way too right we've got a penumbral lunar eclipse uh, happening in early june and i think there is an annular solar eclipse that's also happening in the later part of june something to be mindful of now that might not be visible to us here from the us but in some of the other parts of the world that might be visible Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, I think uh, uh, Sukada. I think Sukada's uh, headset battery seemed to be having some trouble here. Uh, Sukada, do you have any question? Any more questions? Can you still hear us? Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. A little bit noisy, but that's fine. Yeah. So there's one question. CDL a good stacking software. I was trying to find a complete astrophotography processing software package for my Mac, but I don't have Photoshop, Lightroom, or Pixel inside or anything like that. The question is about CDL. 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 CD as in the Apple CD. L. I also copy pasted it just in the chat to get you guys the right name. It's okay. an open source uh, stacking uh, application. It performs well. It's uh, not as flexible as other uh, commercial applications like PixInsight, but if all you need to do is to do stacking, it's pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, again, I want to remind uh, uh, those folks out there that uh, the uh, San Jose Astronomy Club has imaging or astrophotography workshops that Glenn and Bruce does, and a lot of uh, how to uh, uh, knowledge sharing, and we also have a Google group for that. Uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, I would encourage you to join the club and, uh, and uh, get engaged with these folks, and they can guide you. All right, Sukada, anything more? I think just one more question, but that's again answered in the chat channel. It's about this star called, I hope I pronounced this right. It's called Zubin Shemel, no, Zubin Shemali in Libra. So the question is from Chris asking, why does it look be? And Francisco answered that question in the chat channel. Uh, some observers see it as green, but it's, it's more more commonly seen as white. And it depends on individual eye response to the colors. That's pretty interesting. But there are no more new questions coming in. Hmm. 
Okay. okay. All right. So if the if you don't uh, well, we are already a little bit over our a lot of time. Uh, I if you don't have any more questions, I unfortunately I, I, I doesn't look like my screen uh, is not it's not showing up. You guys can't see my screen, right? Rashi, do you want to take can, over and show? We the can screen? see the we can see the Q and A, but let you me just quickly um, yeah. So if you want me to quickly show the upcoming events, I can go ahead and do that. Uh, I think now I can, right? Because if you can see Q and A, I can show the upcoming events. There can we go. The upcoming... It's okay, coming good. up. So right, go to the so... next slide. Yep. There All we go. All right, uh, folks. Uh, so we are going to move a number of our events uh, online. So this is the Armchair Star Party. This is the first installment. Hopefully, we can continue this event. Uh, and we have guest speaker events and uh, so, uh, solar observing, by the way, is tomorrow. And the guest speakers and uh, the Astronomy 101, Introduction to Astronomy, and the Imaging Meetings, they are all online. Go to sjaa.net, and you will get the uh, the schedule and uh, on all those events. And uh, with this, I would like to um, uh, wrap up today's session. Uh, thank you very much for everybody for participating. Uh, uh, really appreciate your support here, and send us feedback. By the way, this uh, I believe the YouTube feed should be available if you want to go look uh, uh, look at it again. It should be available sometime later. Yeah, hey, Kanch, can you move to the thank you slide? I think we have that annotated on, annotated on the thank you it slide there. as well. Okay, good. There we go. Um, and uh, a big thanks for Rashi, who was uh, really leading uh, getting this slide set and the look and feel of the slide sets done. And then also for Glenn uh, um, and his team to uh, for, for getting these images and all the Sky Safari hacks no guys, sorry, Stellarium hacks. The 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 <laughs> <laughs> there are two programs that we use. So I used the wrong name, Stellarium, the free one. Um, to to put all these images, uh, it's uh, it's great, guys. Um, and uh, again, uh, big thanks for our audience. I uh, hope to see you guys in the next event. Yeah, and one other one other thing, just to add, we're going to leave the screen on for a few more seconds or a couple of minutes, actually. So if there are any last minute questions that you might have or anything that you want to know, the chat will be on because as soon as we close out the feed, then the chat will disappear. So we'll just keep uh, keep that going for a little bit longer. Thank you, everybody, and uh, thanks to all the SJA members. <laughs>